So I am a, a statistician by training, uh, working in all things quantitative mass spectrometry and proteomics. And so today I would like to talk about the aspects of reproducibility which come with um, quantitative analysis. So before I do that, I need to define what we mean by reproducibility. And so reproducibility, it's actually not a thing. It's a spectrum of things that we may want to uh, consider when we do computational work, but also experimental work. So on one side of the spectrum, we have uh, studies which are publication only, you know, write only, and this is not what we want, right? But then there is a whole um, collection of aspects which we may uh, want to ensure. So the repeatable data analysis is the analysis which will, like let's say you publish something and you say we obtain uh, this type of results, we should be able to take the data, we should be able to take the same workflow and get the same numbers back. So we should be able to have from A to Z everything that was done. But this is really a minimal bar for us because what we also want to do is to use maybe different tools or different approaches because the fact is that there are many equally reasonable ways to deal with a particular problem. And so, of course, if you use a different tool, you will not have exactly the same numbers back, but you should have qualitatively the same conclusions because otherwise, if your conclusions depend on your tools, well, that's not biology, right? So this is very uh, specific to the tools. And what we want more is not only to be able to reanalyze the data and get qualitatively the same results, but also be able to repeat the experiment. Let's say we want to reanalyze the same biological samples once again, redo all the data analysis workflow. We will not have exactly the same numeric values, but we should again have the same uh, qualitative conclusions. And of course, the gold standard for reproducibility would actually take new biological samples from the same problem, but new individuals, new organisms repeat the entire study and get qualitatively the same results. And so I would like to argue that the statistical mindset really plays in through the entire spectrum. And so on the repeatable data analysis, we want to make sure that we have uh, approaches which are documentable, fully transparent, um, open source as much as possible and so on. And then for reproducibility, we want to make sure that our conclusions are not uh, too dependent on the tools or on the parameters or on the options uh, that we use. And then on the experimental side of the spectrum, we also need to make sure that we have uh, approaches such as assay characterization. So is assay is even suitable for the question we may want to ask, system suitability, quality control, and more generally, standard operating procedures for selecting subjects into the study randomization and so on. And so my lab uh, aims to contribute across the entire spectrum. So unfortunately, I will not have a uh, possibility to tell you about everything. So what I would like to do is focus on this part also because this is a uh, developers meeting. So we'll talk only about uh, how we can think about getting closer to reproducible results specifically for the purpose of reanalysis of existing data sets. And I will take a even more specific view. I will only consider a label free quantification and we will think about differential abundance. So again, there are many questions we can ask, ask uh, with this data in terms of quantitative analysis. So I will only focus on differential abundance. And the idea is that, well, all the things that contribute to our conclusions regarding differential abundance, they actually may or may not impact the final biological results. You know, if we identify yet another spectrum or quantify yet another peak, it may or may not affect what we can say at the protein level. And so, but some of the things can obviously have really strong impact. And so I will kind of think about what are the components which affect our conclusions of protein abundance. And even more specifically, I will talk about how kind of MS stats tries to uh, work in this direction. But before I do that, I would like to show you, so this is what kind of I would like to talk about today. Before I talk about MS stats, I would like to share with you a fairly uh, old study now, but this to me is one of the motivations of why we started doing the work we do in the last several years. And so this is the study where my group was part, part in. So it is Association of Biomedical Resource Facilities uh, you may be familiar with that. It's an association of um, core facilities, which essentially not aiming at doing like new cutting edge research, but rather they want to establish good practice. And for that, they create studies which have some shared input and then every participant uh, analyzes data and then they compare notes and they say, okay, what, what worked, what didn't work. 
and the study that my group um, was part uh, in was specifically for uh, relative protein quantification, so label free in DDA uh, mode. And because we wanted to compare the results, we needed some context where we know the ground truth. And so for that, we created a controlled mixture where we had um, a complex um, yeast background and we had these proteins spiked in various abundances. So we know which proteins change and all the background proteins, they are uh, constant. And so this data set was um, acquired and it was also analyzed by the participants of, of the study. And then we gave to all the uh, core facilities either raw data or data which have the identification of MSMS spectra, or even more, we also process the data with Skyline and we said, okay, here's an Excel spreadsheet essentially with all the features quantified and identified. So your goal is only to do the statistical analysis and tell us what is changing, what is not changing. And the participants could pick where they start from the very raw data, just from the identifications or from the um, Skyline report. And uh, this was uh, some of the results. So here we have the uh, study ID um, ordered by the number of proteins. So these are the participants which uh, used intensity-based relative quantification. These used spectral counting. This used a uh, hybrid approach. This was not documented. So here is the number of proteins which were reported by different participants. And you see already that even by the number of proteins, there was quite a bit of variability of what they do. These guys only reported differentially abundant proteins. They misunderstood the instructions. So there is a lot that really goes uh, uh, into that. But again, the focus was not really the protein numbers, but differential abundance. And so this is the summary slide for that. So again, same thing. So here we have a uh, number. Uh, so this is the study ID. This is based on intensity, on spectral counting, and so on. So here we have the horizontal line. Below the horizontal line, is the number of differentially abundant proteins which were reported correctly. So if you remember, we have, uh, so there's all pairs of comparisons, right? So there's up to 36 possibilities. So this is the number of truly differentially abundant proteins which were reported by the participants. Well, above the horizontal line, these are the false positives. And so you see the difference, right? Between different uh, participants. And it doesn't matter if they did intensity or spectral counting or something else. It doesn't matter if they started with peaks or with peptide IDs or with raw data. There was really substantial variation uh, between what was done. Now, in the defense of participants, I know that some of them were just playing, you know, they were just, not all the methods were considered as like entirely reasonable, but still there were many who did their very best. In that. And so this is really uh, what is happening. And so we tried to understand, okay, what, what went wrong, especially for those who had many uh, false positives. And when the participants submitted the analysis, they filled in a form which was fairly detailed and say, okay, what did you do for identification? What did you do for quantification? And they had to really report all the details. And we worked very hard to somehow classify that. And it was very difficult. You know, sometimes they just said in-house scripts, you know, or our scripts, you know, well, thank you very much, right? So what can we do uh, with that? Um, sometimes it will be some, you know, the, the descriptions that they had indicated that the user didn't quite understand the software because there was no way that that tool would do what they say. And so, so there were all these levels that we tried to um, parse, right? And so here is the input, the, what, the ID, quant, and so on. We use different colors uh, for different tools. Well we could not find any system and it doesn't matter. The point of this figure is that there are a lot of colors, right? So it means that there are really many ways that you can use to go about this problem and different people have their own uh, favorite um, frameworks. We group this submission. So here each row is a submission, right? So here's the submission ID. So we group the submissions by positive predictive value. So this is the proportion of true positives among the claimed positives. So if a study says these are differentially abundant proteins, how often they're actually uh, right. And so here, positive predictive value is 70% or higher. This is not so great between 20 and 70%. This is really bad, right? This is uh, 20%. And so then, well, when we have all these results, the very first question is, okay, is there any tool that did better? You know, did Skyline do better than MaxQuant, you know, or something like that? And uh, well, turns out that different participants tried the same tools with very different results. 
And here, um, all the studies used some combination of max quantum per se, well, with varying uh, success. And then here they use skyline and some linear modeling in R, also with various success. These participants compared peak intensity versus spectral count found that both worked well. This group compared and found that one worked much better than the other. So really uh, a lot of diversity here. And so the only thing kind of that, uh, two things that came out of the study were this. So first of all, we can do a reasonable job with multiple tools. So we can do a reasonable job with Skyline, we can do a reasonable job with MaxQuant and so on. So there are multiple reasonable ways to go about this problem. And then the second takeaway was here. So here is the lab ID. So you can see that the same lab could make multiple submissions. They could analyze the data in several ways. And here I'm circling the submissions from the same lab. And so within one exception here, lab number six, you see that those circles never cross this line. So the labs who have the expertise, they can take multiple tools and they will do well, right? And then the labs who need training, they can do multiple tools and it will not necessarily help. And so the second takeaway for us was the need for, you know, just training and documenting and explaining how this works so that people can use the tools as effectively as possible. And so this was one of the motivations of the work that we set out uh, doing in our lab, trying to say, well, how can we mitigate a little bit these workflows, given that, you know, people use different tools, they have different strategies, they have different options, the tools are developed in different contexts and they make decisions for good reasons, you know. So how can we minimize the dependency on our, of our conclusions on the tools and to do it in a way which is as automated as possible so that we minimize also that. But of course, the need for training doesn't go away here. And so this is now the next, um, uh, the next aspect. So this is also not the most recent work from us, but I wanted to share how MS Stats approaches that. So MS Stats is a R uh, software which takes as input a report from a tool such as MaxQuant, OpenMS, uh, Skyline, Proton Discover, and so on. So our input is some kind of a array essentially, which for each a uh, feature in the spectra, so essentially a combination of M over Z and retention time, so some uh, feature in the three-dimensional space uh, uh, that Timo introduced earlier. And um, we have this quantified across different replicates, right? And so the first question is how can we minimize the, de minimize the dependency of our conclusions on these tools? And so this is what we have um, came up with. So here is two data sets. One is data dependent acquisition. This is from the LFQ paper by Jürgen Cox. And this is a DIE uh, data set from uh, one of the uh, older uh, papers uh, from the Biognosis uh, group. And here this data set is processed by Skyline, MaxQuant, and Progenesis, kind of fairly old. And this one was processed by Skyline and Spectronaut. And so what you see in these figures is so this gray area is the histogram of every single peak quantified in this data set across all the analytes and all the uh, replicate runs. And uh, the first thing that you see that these locations of these histograms, they're not identical between the tools. Like for example, Progenesis reports lower values of uh, feature intensities than Skyline and MaxQuad. For DIA, it's even more pronounced. Spectronaut has much lower values than Skyline, which by itself is not a problem because we're interested in relative quantification, right? So as long as the changes are fine, for example, if you quantify the peak by the entire area under the curve versus you truncate the tails, well, of course, you will have different values of peak abundance. But as far as relative quantification, it's not necessarily um, bothering you. But what is interesting now, if we look at the details, I hope you can see, for example, here the Skyline reports 203,000 peaks. 1,000 zeros and 33 missing values. Now, MaxQuant reports 224,000 peaks, no zeros, but 38,000 missing values, right? And so here has zero missing values, but only 56,000 peaks. So the number of peaks and the number of things that can be reported varies substantially between the tools. And the same thing here between Skyline and Spectronaut. So for example, Skyline has 2,000 missing values here, Spectronaut has 13 missing values. So very different. And what we decided to do, because we want to work with every tool, we want to take as input the output of every tool, we decided to not interpret these tools 
the output of these tools literally, but try to kind of read between the lines a little bit what's the intention. And so the intention is that, well, when the peaks are very kind of well resolved and high, everybody can probably do a good job quantifying them. However, when the peaks are very small, then the tools really differ. So they may have an A, they may have zeros, they may have very small values, but the point is that these values are not reliable. So they are not very accurate because they're hard to distinguish from noise, it's hard to localize the peaks and identify the peaks correctly. And so we have a internal cutoff, which is just kind of a tuning parameter, which is essentially what we're doing, we're taking a 99th percentile on the right side of this histogram, we calculate its distance from the median, and then we flip this distance to the lower point. We assume that these histograms are roughly symmetric. And so this cutoff is such that we say below this cutoff, we don't trust the values. So call them zero, missing, small values, whatever. We just say there, we don't trust them. And we will say that they are not reliable for reasons of low abundance of analyte. So there can be other issues. For example, the peak may not be quantified correctly. For example, two peaks are highly overlapped. Skyline would distinguish those. So the NA for skyline, it's when the peak is there, but they cannot quantify it reliably. But this is really an exception. Most other tools, they will just report either small value or NA. And so now we will say, well, except for, for this specific issue with skyline, we will say that if we have a value which is in the lower tail, tail we will view it as missing and we'll view it as censored. So censored is a statistical term for saying it's missing, but it's missing in an informative manner. So we know it's small. So we don't know the exact value, but we know that this will be a uh, small value. And so from there, well, we can view this type of data structure. This is for one protein. So here the columns are the runs and the runs may be grouped by subjects if we have multiple technical runs from the same subject. And then we have multiple subjects come from one condition and the other condition. And then we have also the features. And so the interest here will be the intensities of the peaks. We work on the log scale because log values have much better statistical properties. And instead of looking at ratios, when I look at differences or averages on the log scale. And so now we have these values when they're observed and the missing values, some of them are uh, censored values. And so there's a whole statistical theory behind this type of data structures, how to model them, how to explain all the sources of variation, and how to essentially distinguish changes in, in aggregate abundance of, over all of these replicates between conditions, how to distinguish that from artifacts due to random noise and variation. And I'm happy to talk to you about this uh, offline. So the upshot is that we can take this really complicated model, we can partition this into two steps, which are actually commonly done in proteomics, without really thinking of the underlying theory, is that first we can summarize all the features in the run in a single number, and then we can analyze the summarized values using whatever approach reflects the experimental design. The difference from what we do is that we have kind of a theoretical understanding of what is the global model that is represented by this two-step approach. First is the summarization and the second is the estimation. And the summarization has two properties. It accounts for the censored values. So these are the values that are small, uh, missing but small, and it's also robust. So it also accounts for outlying uh, intensities. And it looks kind of like this. This is a very typical representation in MS stats. So this is the mass spectrometry runs. These are the log intensities on the Y axis. The gray lines are the features. So this was from this IPRG study what I mentioned in the beginning. This is a spiked protein. So for example, here comparing two conditions, we know that the true fall change is 7.5. If we do the summarization, uh, taking the sum of the intensities first and then the log, it is confused by some of the abundant outliers. If we use some linear model, it's confused by low abundant outliers. TMP is two key median polish. It's a robust summarization without censoring. And MS stats does both censoring and robust summarization. It's the closest to the true fault change. Okay, but now going back to reproducible research, right? Because this is why we are really trying to do that. So what was really important for us is to see how dependent our conclusions are now on the tools or could we somehow overcome some of the differences between the tools in reporting the results. And these are some examples. So this is specific to data dependent acquisition. Uh, we have accumulated over time a variety of 
benchmark or controlled mixtures where we have some notion of ground truth. So here are three of them. This is the IPRG I mentioned in the beginning. This is from Jorgen Cox uh, from his paper. This is another spike in uh, data set with DDA. And as a comparison, we just look at summarizing all the features by taking the sum and then the log versus this approach that MSTATS uh, employs. And the circles in the diagrams, this will be the, true, the three tools. And they report the number of proteins detected as differentially abundant after processing by each tool. And this is only among those which are truly differentially abundant. And so you see that consistently um, the MSTAT summarization maximizes or at least increases the overlap uh, between the circles. And we see that now the consensus becomes higher just because we kind of eliminated some of these artifacts in the reporting. And the same thing for DIA. We have also a collection of spiked in mixtures uh, with DIA and also processed with multiple tools. And we see that these intersections are consistently higher. Uh, than the intersections with some naive uh, summarization. So this was very encouraging to us because it means that to some extent we can overcome some of these discrepancies in decisions that the tools uh, make. But then the next question was, is it enough? Well, and it's clearly not enough because there is still some discrepancy, right? So we still have quite a bit of differentially abundant proteins which are specific to a particular tool, even after this processing. And we try to investigate this a little bit. And so this is the next part where uh, we look a little bit more closely into data processing. So the specific choice of finding the peaks, quantifying peaks, identifying them, aligning them between uh, conditions, and maybe also things such as what exactly is a peak? Like for example, do we use the entire isotopic distribution? Do we take the monoisotopic peak? You know, there are many, kind of, many issues which uh, go into that. And so this is a study I just wanted to share with you that looks into that a little bit more. So this is in a collaboration with the Ebersod Lab and also with Brendan McLean um, from the MACOS Lab. This was one of the first DIA uh, studies published in MCP in 2015. Uh, this is an actual biological experiment. So this is yeast exposed to osmotic stress at six time points. And so for six time points, at each time point, we have three biological replicates. So we see how yeast responds to the stress. And so it was um, data required on a uh, SAX uh, instrument. What was different about this data set is that it was prepared in two ways. So one was the actual analysis of this data where um, in this case, for example, with uh, Skyline, we looked at all peptide precursors and used top six fragments in DIA to quantify um, every peptide ion. But at the same time, before collecting the data, uh, the authors of this manuscript, they tried to essentially design the experiment. They tried to develop their assays in a way similar as you would design SRM assays. What they did was they took a particular condition, and I don't remember what it was, I think the first time point, and they had just one condition, they did separate eight replicates of technical replicates of one sample. So they had eight technical DIA runs on the same biological material. And then they said, okay, how well can we quantify each peptide ion if we just repeat the same thing over and over? And they looked at things such as um, coefficient of variation, and they also looked at how often they have missing values. And then they said, okay, instead of quantifying everything that we can see, let us only quantify proteins using peptide ions, which pass essentially quality control in this refinement runs. So we design our DIA kind of like we design uh, SRM assays. And then we also did other things. So we looked at the skyline in these two approaches. We also analyzed this data with Spectronaut and uh, DIA uh, Empire. And by the way, when I say we analyze, it's actually an overstatement. What really happened was that we reached out to the developers of each of the tools and the developers kindly agreed to do the data analysis for us because what we wanted to do, we wanted to minimize us making mistakes with the tools. And so these are the analysis, and by the way, the previous part as well. So these are the analysis which are done by the original tool developers to make sure that we don't do something wrong. Okay, so now for the yeast. So this is what happened here. Um, these are differential abundant proteins comparing each time point to the time point zero. This is what happens if we use all the features to quantify the proteins. 
And this is what happens if we only use the low CV, so the designed features, which supposedly represent protein abundances or peptide ion abundances better. And so you see here that, sorry, that's my laptop. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so we see that the first time point we have 74 differentially abundant proteins, then 300, then 500, it went up quite a bit, then went down, then went again up. We don't know the ground truth, it's an actual biological study, but I would argue that biology is kind of smooth, right? So yeast responds to the stress somehow in a smooth manner. And so having number of differentially abundant proteins that goes down and then again up and then down, it's probably not very realistic. So if you look at the low CV measurements, well, yeah, we lost quite a few proteins, right? We lost like 400 proteins. But then in terms of the number of differentially abundant proteins, it's a lot more smooth. So this would be, I would argue more realistic. So this is initially points to low CV, so designing this data extraction being beneficial. And this is now one particular protein comparing time point 60 to time point zero. And this is what the features are. So again, the gray lines, these are all the features mapped to this protein across replicate runs. And you see there is quite a bit of noise. But then if we look at the low CV data, then it cleaned up quite a bit. Well, there's one outlier, but MS stats can deal with this outlier very easily. And so now, well, in this case, well, there's not much difference in terms of the fault change. The p-value increased, meaning probably less evidence for differential abundance. And this is overall, we see that there's quite a bit of discrepancy in terms of comparing which proteins are changing in abundance, depending on how we set up our analysis. This is another protein here. So in this case, also, low CV cleaned up some of the features and the p-value changed from, you know, larger to small. So this will be one of those proteins here. So data processing matters, right? Even like how we design this. And then we also looked at different tools. This is Skyline low CV. This was Spectronaut and DIA Empire. Uh, disclosure for DIA Empire was not designed for this type of data. So they need higher mass resolution data. So this is not a negative reflection on DIA Empire. But you see that different tools really do different things on this same protein. And so now if we kind of try to see how we can do the summarization with MS stats, so the green line is using again log sum summarization and the red line is the robust sensor summarization. We see that we can mitigate to some extent the differences between the tools, but still data processing matters. So we cannot say that we solve all the problems. So we really have to be careful in how we a work um, upstream of the statistical analysis. And so now also looking how MS stats perform. So actually in this particular problem, we don't know the truth, but we know the pathway which is supposed to be activated by this stress. And so the overlap with the proteins in this pathway is also higher if you do robust summarization. So, okay. But then going back to reproducible research. So we established the data processing matters because the input that we do would take to statistical analysis, we can mitigate it to some extent, but not completely. And then the next question we ask, well, can we do some post-processing? So for example, here, it was clear that the low CV essentially cleaned up some of the features. It just removed some of the features here. Can we do this somehow after the fact without having to collect, the, collect those eight refinement runs and analyze them and decide what are the correct features and then extract these features from the real data? And we tried to do that. So this was the next um, kind of feature in MS stats now. And we are continuing now with the CELFSEC uh, data set. Um, the full data set is without using these refinement runs. We just said, okay, we take all the precursors. We use six fragments per peptide ion. And we have missing values whenever the Q value of ID doesn't pass this threshold. Now full, some clean up here, 50%. All precursors, six fragments. If the feature has missing values in over half of the runs, for example, because of the Q value issue, just get rid of this feature. So now we eliminate some of these features as part of this. And now we do the same thing using these refinement runs. Let's only use things with low CV and introduce missing values if the Q value is no good, or let's eliminate the entire features if we have missing values. And so now we can look at this uh, a little bit. So this would be the examples of these data sets. And you see that it really matters. 
So even this type of decision, so this is full sparse. So we have some missing values which are here, right? And so we have quite a bit of noise in these gray lines. Here, this is full 50% that has less of this kind of issues here because we eliminated some of the features. And now this is taking low CV and sparse. It's even cleaner, but clearly it has implications for the total number of proteins. We are losing proteins as we do extra, use extra filtering. And we also lose things in terms of differential abundance. So the question was, could we take noisy data and somehow filter out those features in some other ways? And that's what we try to do as well. So now we have a, so it's a new functionality in MS stats where we have this workflow where we look for features with low coverage, but instead of saying 50% or more, we eliminate the feature, we say, given this number of replicates and given this pattern of missing values in this acquisition, what would be an extreme number of missing values? And so we have some um, approach essentially based on probability distribution of how likely these patterns of missing values is to be occurred. So we have a cutoff, which is not just 50%, but data set specific. And then we look at the estimates of consensus profile for each protein, what constitutes usual variation, what constitutes outlier variation. We detect these outliers, detect noisy features, and we try to clean this up based on these considerations as opposed to, let's say, take top three features or eliminate features with 50% missing values or some additional uh, ad hoc kind of rules. And so this is one example. This is from a DIA experiment, uh, two conditions. So again, it's a spike in experiment. Gray lines are the features. Blue line is the summarization from top three features. Black line is the summarization with all the features. And so here the true fault change is fairly small, log fault change is, is one. And so we see top three goes in the opposite direction. All features, there's too much noise to claim any difference. So same thing uh, here. And so cleaning up these features, so this is what MS stats would do. So it gets rid of this particular feature, for example, and here. And so it gets us closer to the true estimation of differential abundance. Now, the question is, what do we do with those features that we eliminate? Well, it depends. We can just eliminate them completely, or we, make it, we may say, you know, maybe these features behave differently from the rest of the protein for some biological reasons, for example, for reasons of PTMs. So then we can flag them and we can look at them separately if needed. So that's also a possibility. And then if we do this, so here I'm also looking uh, at the agreement between different data processing steps. So this is taking all of these different processing strategies, looking for agreement of differential abundance. And there's a little bit, but now if we add this feature filtering, kind of data set specific feature filtering, oops, the agreement between all of those data processing strategies is higher. So in other words, we're also trying to mitigate the impact of these ad hoc choices that we make by trying to eliminate features in a way which is specific to a data set as opposed to some fairly arbitrary rules. And so in terms of reproducibility between the tools, same thing, right? So this is what happens with base MS stats if we use all the features. Now this is what happens if we have top three features, top 10, and this is with the new kind of feature filtering, right? We see that feature filtering again improves the agreement of conclusions uh, between the tools. So this also allows us to be less dependent on the tool which uh, we used upstream. So MS stats actually does a lot more than what I described and I don't have time to tell you about this in detail, but maybe I would just say that we are trying to be equal opportunity, you know, for all the upstream tools. So whatever your favorite uh, tool is, we're trying to work with that well as much as possible. So we try to have converters to uh, the tools, or in some cases, like for example, with OpenMS or with Skyline, we actually have a bit tighter uh, integration um, with the different formats. And as I mentioned in the beginning for reproducibility, there's also quite a bit of work in terms of assay characterization, quality control, and experiment planning, sample size calculation. MS Stats has quite a bit of functionalities, and we do a lot of work in this direction uh, these days. We also try to work on some of the graphical user interfaces. Uh, it's work in progress, we're getting there. So there will be ways for people to interact with this um, just from kind of, uh, through the interface. Um, I didn't talk at all about our work with labeled experiments. So MS Stats TMT is a sister uh, package which works specifically with uh, 
uh, with TMT labeling. So we, and this is also already available and um, uh, fully functional. But so now just in the next uh, few minutes, uh, we have, there's another topic I really would like to mention. So as you hopefully saw from, from this work that benchmarking different methods is really important. And we benefited a lot from having controlled mixtures or some kind of data where we have some sense of the ground truth to understand if some approaches are helpful or not helpful and by how much. And we feel that this is something that needs to be done a lot, both when developing new methods, but also, you know, eventually when you do the actual biology, because you want to know if your conclusion is specific to a particular tool or depends on a specific ad hoc filtering criterion or something else. And for that, you need to be able to reanalyze the data in different ways and essentially subject your analysis to a stress test. And your analysis has to survive the stress test so that you really start kind of believing that this is not just an artifact. And when we started doing this, well, we are an entirely dry lab. We don't generate our own data. So we looked at where we can find data to do that, how we can evaluate <coughs> our methods. And you know, when you talk to people about this, everybody will say, of course, there are lots of data there, right? So there are all these repositories we just heard about earlier today, which have a very large number of data. So for example, Massive in particular um, has 9,000, almost 10,000 public data sets, right? It has 20,000 proteins, it has billions of spectra, right? So this is really very large resources. As it turned out, these resources have a very limited utility for the type of work that we do because they do not contain the information required for the quantitative studies. And we took this to heart. And so this is now a ongoing collaboration uh, with Nuno Bandera, uh, who is the PI on the uh, Massive. So we had some funding from NIH to essentially improve that. And this is the starting point. So this is just recent, we started really uh, recently when we looked into, okay, in Massive, so what is available if we want to do quantitative work? And so out of those 9,000 public experiments in Massive, well, only 137 have anything regarding quantification. So any kind of pick, pick something, right? Or some kind of reports which talk about quantitative analysis. Well, this by itself is not a problem because as long as we have raw data, we can reanalyze this data, you know, in any way. What is really the problem is this, only 41 data sets out of 9,000 have the information on the study design. And without that, you cannot proceed, right? So you need to know which condition which replicate came from which condition and what these conditions mean if it's some kind of controlled mixture like what's the truth right or at least what's the biology behind this if you have any but the minimum is really what map the runs to replicates to understand what is comparable and what not comparable and of course what you also want to know was it randomized right so can we even trust any of the conclusions from that so in massive there is essentially like an annotation box that you can check saying do you have information on the study design and if you just search for this, well, it's a little bit, I think, more than 41. But then what happened was the box is checked and you go in and there is nothing. Because also there's very difficult to maintain quality control when uh, people submit, uh, submit data. So this was a really big challenge. And in our work, what ends up being that we work just with our collaborators and we uh, ask them for uh, the data or we look at published papers and we can kind of do the work based on that. So it's essentially a lot of uh, manual work. And so Nuna's lab and our lab, we set out to change that. And we're in the very early stages. And so this is my first uh, request to you guys, right? So um, what, we, what is now done in Massive, so there is a extension to Massive called Massive Quant, which specifically focuses on uh, quantitative uh, data and uh, reanalysis. And we, using our experience with this data and using the experience that Nuno has, we established essentially a schema or some, kind, some representation of what it would take to store and fully reproduce a quantitative experiment. With the understanding there's so much diversity, right? And there's so many different tools and so many different labeling strategies or you know, data acquisitions and data processing. And we came up with this fairly high level structure, which a description of data acquisition then we have a description of something which pertains to the identification of spectral features of peptides and proteins. Then something which describes how the data processing on the quantitative side 
is done. And then it describes statistical analysis and then also some identifiers um, of the data submissions. And what we would like to do is not just to store a workflow, but we would like to store every alternative analysis that people thought of being useful. And you know, it may be one, it may be 10. So whatever is important for a particular data set. And so here are some examples. We have three DDA experiments, which I mentioned uh, earlier. And so they would be, you know, analyzed. So for example, here you have multiple search engines. Now for each search engine, you can analyze the data with Skyline and then with Progenesis or, you know, with MaxQuant and then Proteum Discover. And from there, you would analyze here, we use MSTAT as a unifying tool because it takes the output from everything. Uh, if there's another data analysis tool which takes output from all of this, totally fine, it can be part of that. And so now we have, we store the results of the analysis from all of these different pass pathways, essentially, that describe a quantitative workflow. And the reason for this is this. So if we are developing a new method and we're really focusing, let's say, on statistics, and we don't want to invent new identification or new kind of pick picking and so on, we all should be able to take the same input and work with that. Because otherwise, you know, if my statistics are also different because I use different search engine, it's not very, very helpful, right? And so this allows us to start from any intermediate point and work on whatever we want to work with uh, while having comparable inputs uh, between different tools. So this is one and the other is if you want to do some biological work then you may be interested in different reanalysis of the same data set to understand, do my conclusions regarding differential abundance depend on a particular choice of workflow? And if the results depend on the choice of workflow, it's not necessarily a problem, but you want to track this down and understand why and why some workflow picked up something interesting and the other workflow didn't pick up something interesting. So this is what we have now. If you look at the uh, massive quant, uh, this is the structure that we have. And so these are the different data sets. So all the data sets I mentioned here, they are already available as of right now. And here you can, I'm not sure if you can see there are pluses here. If you click on plus, it expands what quantification result is. For example, here it talks about quantification, differential abundance, study design, all is present. And so here you have the identifiers of the entire workflow that corresponds to the reanalysis. Again, there's a plus here. If you click, it gives you more identifiers. Um, and it tells you some summary information, some, such as how many reanalysis you have. Um, I think later on, it also talks about like how many proteins and things like that. So my request to you is please contribute. Because this is, the hope is, you know, that we will populate this with other data sets and we will be working very diligently with Nuno on, uh, you know, recovering what we can recover from public data, but we really don't think we will be able to do much because of the difficulty with the, um, you know, with the annotations. And if we can do something, it will be very kind of labor intensive manual work. And I, I think that the best way to move forward is actually to have new submissions from the work we're doing now, while everybody still remembers what was done, right? And still remembers what are the workflows. So the submissions do not have to be fully automated. For example, if you use a tool, I don't know, Proteum Discover, right? Which is kind of has a user interface and it's not kind of run in a scripted way. It's totally fine. So we just have the last input to Proteum Discover stored and then the first output from the Proteum Discover stored and documenting what was done, right? So, but then uh, what Nuna will be doing in the back, eventually he will be reanalyzing all the data so that you have an entirely computable alternative to this analysis. But whatever you did for your manuscript, if you used something which is, you know, not entirely programmatic, it's totally fine. We just store all the intermediate outputs along the way. And there is an infrastructure in massive quant um, for that. So this is one thing. And then the, next, the, the last thing I want to mention is uh, the education training. As I mentioned in the very beginning, we do think that training our users is important. And by that, I don't mean just, okay, here is a tool, here's how you click and get some numbers out, but why, right? So what's important, what's not important, right? What are the statistical principles behind that? What are the reasonable alternatives in this case? And what is completely unreasonable for, for some reason? And uh, we really took this to heart as well. And so we are hosting for several years now, I think it's our sixth year, um, this year, uh, is an event, it's called May Institute for Computation and Statistics for Mass Spectrometry and Proteomics. So May is a month of May. 
So it was meant to be summer school, but it's in May, so it's May Institute. And uh, two first weeks of May, and this is a program that lasts two weeks, and it has two parallel classrooms, so some of the things uh, run in uh, parallel, and it has pieces of or modules of two and a half days. So it doesn't mean that uh, participants have to be there for entire two weeks. You pick and choose portions of the two and a half days which are relevant to, to what you do. And so we have a really exciting program. So we have two and a half days on targeted proteomics with Skyline, uh, which is taught by Sua Batiello and also Tina uh, Ludwig and Lindsay Pino. And then we have two and a half days from OpenMS and we're super grateful from the contribution from Julianus and Timo who have been around for several years now. And so this really is an exciting uh, collaboration with us. Beginner statistics in R is taught by Laurent and Mina and these are fantastic instructors. They're very engaging. So this is probably for people who have never seen R commands in their life, right? So this is for uh, very beginners. And then we have intermediate R and data visualization. So this will be more like along the lines of tidyverse in R and principles of data visualization and so on. And then we have statistics for uh, quantitative mass spectrometry taught by Mina and by myself. So this is really about kind of all things MSTATS, but in much more depth, including MSTATS, TMT and so on. We have a keynote from Bernard Kuster who will talk about his take on TMT labeling specifically. And so how we can uh, work together. And then we have a capstone two and a half days, which essentially a program which puts all of the skills together. So this will be using one of this yeast data set that I mentioned and a couple other things in the context of DIA. And so how can we use Skyline with different processing approaches and different filters that I just mentioned briefly? And what are the implications of these choices on the protein level conclusions? And so it's fully integrating from raw data pro processing to MSTAT's workflow and uh, the biology and so this is led by Brendan and Brian Shorl and we have a keynote uh, from uh, Rudy or oh, and I forgot to mention that Nuna will also speak about the massive quant and how to interact with that. So we have two additional programs one is by request of many participants we have a scientific writing half a day workshop so this is uh, uh, run by a person who is an English major but who spent many years as a text editor in proteomics journals. So this is someone who knows specifically about proteomics and mass spectrometry and how to communicate effectively. And so just a half day program on talking about how to structure manuscripts. So this is all good, but what is really new this year, and we have not done this before, is this part. So we realized that in the last years, our program was mostly in outreach to our users and how we can use these tools effectively and so on. But what we would like to do next is to spend more time with people who develop computational tools. And so this year we included a two day workshop on a Saturday and Sunday, it's a weekend uh, workshop, which we call future developers meeting, just to indicate that we welcome future developers and no, you don't have to be an established developer uh, to be part of that. And the goal here is to talk about how do we develop tools specifically for mass spectrometry and proteomics and not in terms of you know here is my latest and greatest functionality but more like these are the design principles this is how i make it you know agile and flexible and responsive to the new developments in the technology but also reproducible and reusable you know and sustainable once some group members leave and other group members uh, come in and what we will do there is well you know the program is R centric so we have two keynotes uh, from um, Lauren Gatto who is the author of MSN Bayes and Kylie Bemis who is the author of Cardinal but so, so they are in R but the program is not R centric so if you do work in Python or in some other language we would very much like you to join us uh, at this meeting and so we have two half days available for oral presentations or poster presentations where we hope that people who develop tools can interact and uh, share their um, experience. And so this is it. And I will just need to thank a lot of people, but maybe I will just highlight uh, Mina Choi, who is hiding here, who is the lead uh, developer of MS Stats, and uh, Kylie, who is uh, the lead developer of another um, software effort in my lab called uh, Cardinal. And of course, the, all the collaborators and the funding. And I'm happy if you have questions.
I have opposed to why uh, the Lord God has done so. This is, from my perspective, why I have a higher barrier to entry. So you see, I don't think you can find all the interviews with the Jarwin. Uh, yeah, there's really the best reason I can give to you is that we spent a lot of time discussing this project with Nuno. <laughs> and this is how it started. And you know, I'm not a database person, so I totally trust the experts and whatever they tell me is the best way to go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, so, did you look whether the scores for the identifications had higher scores, that there was higher probability of false identifications? No. Uh, about that uh, there are always a certain number of false identifications? Or obviously. Obviously, and it can be because it's like a false ID throughout, but or because you have different IDs and different kind of runs, right? And it manifests itself by having larger quantitative variation. So very likely, right? So this can be multiple reasons. So this can be just low intensity feature, but it very likely can be also some problems with identification. But, you know, as I was saying in the very beginning, we're kind of looking at the very, at the bottom line, right? At the very end, right? And so if we have a protein represented by something, and if we can get relative quantification out of it, for the purpose of this project, it's good enough. I know for many other reasons, it may not be good enough, but for the purpose of that, as long as we can catch this protein, we have some features then it's good. If you lose proteins, well, then, of course, it's a problem, right? And so this was the question, can we somehow, you know, filter these features in the more? Uh, and, and, that's re and that's exactly the reason why we started this project, because then we say, we take the noises data, right, with the largest number of proteins. So the problem here, the reason why we lose so much is because those cutoffs, they're completely arbitrary, right? I remove features which are missing half of the time. What about a third of the time or three quarters of the time, right? So it just becomes a tuning parameter, right? And the same thing, so the CV, um, I forgot what the cutoff was, but again, it's just a, uh, yeah, I, I forgot what the low CV cutoff, but again, it's a, completely, uh, it's a completely arbitrary criterion. And so what we try to do here is to say, can we look at the data set and consider patterns which are appropriate or typical for this data set and then patterns which are not. So here, some variation you certainly expect between the runs, but this you would argue this is not a representative variation, right? And so what we try to do instead of having just some arbitrary reasons to remove things, can we learn it from the data? And this was one of the most difficult projects, by the way, for us, because you don't know, it's an unsupervised method, right? You don't know what's noise, right? And it's very easy to overfit. And we had to work very hard to kind of also benchmark this and say, okay, how can we make sure that we really only detect things which are kind of completely unusual, right? Because you can imagine doing this iteratively, right? You filtered some things, go back, filter more, and then, you know, you have not much left. So this was very difficult, but we think that with the specific workflow that, to which we converged here, we tried to have statistical arguments at each step, which kind of, to some extent, mitigate the overfitting. But I cannot guarantee that we don't overfit completely. The only thing we can do is to do this, right? Just doing benchmarks and show on many data sets that it's reasonable. So that's, that's the one. So unlike everything else where we have some supervision here, it's completely unsupervised. And it, was, it took us a very long time, this project. Yeah. 